Welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Wayne Walker. Tonight we begin our show with a story about the dynamic science of forensics. Now many of the blood testing methods that are making today's courtroom headlines are the same techniques the Idaho Department of Fish and Game uses to investigate wildlife crimes. Often, the conviction of a poacher may depend on what comes out of a test tube. A typical scenario may begin with a fish and game conservation officer following up on a tip phoned in by a witness. Let's say a citizen called Officer Bob Sellers to report that he had seen someone shoot a deer out of season. Bob's first step would be to visit the scene of the alleged crime to search for evidence of an illegal kill. Okay, it looks like we've got some blood here laid out by an animal that was uh, wounded, passed through the area. So what we want to do is collect as much as we can to allow the lab to uh, be able to analyze it to determine uh, what type of blood, like uh, deer or elk, and uh, just to get, get as much information as we can. And so if the blood proves to be from a deer or elk, Bob can rule out other sources such as human blood from a hunter injury, and it will give him another facet of evidence in court to back up the statement from the eyewitness. It's very important without uh, the lab to back up the evidence that we find out in the field, uh, some of the cases that we were able to uh, detect and uh, determine a violator, uh, we wouldn't be able to prove in court. It's just another uh, nail in the coffin of the violator. The evidence is labeled and hand carried to the Fish and Game Wildlife Health Laboratory near Caldwell. Lab biologist Sharon Landon's first task on receiving the evidence is to sort through the mud and debris. Uh, you want to remove anything that's not related to the case um, that's just going to, you know, confuse it, the issue. So uh, usually I try to pick out something that has a great deal of blood on it, such as this piece here. And then eventually what I'll end up doing is pooling all of these samples to get a real good example uh, to run the tests on. Sharon is very meticulous in her handling of the evidence, documenting every step. This will help her to remember the details of each case if she were to be called to testify in court. It's a job that requires a lot of patience and precision and constant updating on the astounding new developments in the field of forensics. But for Sharon, that's a gratifying aspect of the work and part of the challenge. It's, it's an exciting sense of, of doing tests and doing forensics because basically forensics was started um, more seriously towards wildlife in the 80s. And there's looking more and more towards it to, to uh, go to trials and this type of thing. So a lot of the things that they're using in human medicine or with the sheriffs and the police are now being transferred over into what can be done with wildlife. A small amount of distilled water is added to each sample, rehydrating the dried blood that has soaked into the leaves. Okay, and then you can see on this one, this is a pretty good sample because if I was to pull the leaves away a little bit from there, you can see what liquid it is and it is the color of the blood. This sample then travels down the hall to be placed into a centrifuge that will further separate the liquid from the leaves and debris leaving a more concentrated sample for Sharon to work with. Uh, as you can see, the leaves and all the dirt is compacted down to the bottom, which allows us to be able to suck off the portion that looks the stain, the red stain portion of the liquid. Sharon has a plate prepared that contains what's called an antisera in one of these tiny wells. A small droplet of our sample is then placed next to it in one of the remaining wells. Tomorrow we'll read the plates and in fact I read it 24 hours and 48 hours just to make sure. And uh, I'll read the plate to see if there's any reaction between your sample and what I've put down that uh, it will be able to identify whether this is in the um, in this particular case, it would be the deer family. But this is just one example of the forensics work performed in the Fish and Game Health Lab. Often, Sharon will get a request from an officer to identify a species from some hairs found in the bed of a pickup. This is a mule deer hair magnified under the microscope. They bring a variety of 
things and it's just unreal what they can bring but it all pertains to the scene of what happened there and what they think would prove whatever they're trying to prove. Feathers may also be turned into the lab for identification. By comparing it to the lab's collection, Sharon concludes that this one appears to be a tail feather from a red-tailed hawk. If she needs further verification, the feather too will end up under the microscope. X-rays like this one of a trumpeter swan can confirm whether or not an animal has died from a gunshot wound and can also help Sharon locate the pieces of shot in the body cavity that may need to be extracted for ballistic tests. These white spots here are where there's metal that the X-ray is not going through. And, um, and then over here, you can even see the fracture of the bone. So the wing was actually broken as well as being shot in the shoulder portion. And then there's a Trumpeter really swans are a protected species, a so this data could part. prove very valuable to the arresting officer. But whatever the evidence, the challenge for Sharon is to always keep an open mind and to question everything. I think anybody who gets into the science area has um, some interest in, in answering questions in their own mind as to why things happen or the what ifs in the world. And doing forensic is more like doing um, a mini, no, it's like mini mysteries in which a case comes in and you have to take each piece and put it together um, to see if it fits into the story or into the setting or whatever.